Imagine a future where you could wirelessly merge with any human mind. Imagine stepping into the mind and perspective of anyone on the planet at any time and having billions of other people who could do the same to you. In many ways, this is the web in its present state, and we are all experiencing the beginning of the age of the digital hive mind. The concept of hive mind presents enormous philosophical questions. Modern culture tells us that we are special, one of a kind among the vastness of an infinite cosmos. Yet the science of the brain is telling a very different story, and the technologies being developed right now may prove that a cultural digital hive mind is inevitable. When most people hear the term hive mind, they think of a dystopian future filled with cyborg zombies with laser red eyes and a central control system. The familiar icons of Star Trek, Borg, or Agent Smith from The Matrix dominate our cultural consciousness when we think about the hive mind. However, the main reason we view the hive mind as offensive is that it punctures and penetrates the fragile philosophical scaffolding that surrounds the mythology of the individual. I say mythology because we have no idea what it feels like to truly be the other. We have no idea what it really feels like to be inside the mind of another human being. Sure, we can have empathy and try and imagine what someone else is feeling, but a one-to-one correlation does not yet exist. But that may change in the near future. You see, the future will not allow us to segment ourselves into marketable demographics. The rate of change in the era of exponential information awareness will outpace these antiquated models of the self. We mimic, we concur, and we subscribe to the myth of the individual self. My money, my food, my land, my tribe, my body, my mind. However, can this myth of the individual self survive a transparent digital future? I'm not sure it can. The web is a primary and primitive version of the future hive mind. This superorganism or global brain is still developing. With only 40% of the world's population online today, we still have no idea what effect total digital saturation will have on our species. What will our world be like in the future when everyone is connected digitally, brain to brain? The web is, in fact, an entry point into the hive mind. It metabolizes our keystrokes, video uploads, thoughts, and behavioral patterns. It then sends this digital nutrient out to our minds, and we nurse and suckle on the minds of our fellow human beings. The hive mind concept stirs the amygdala, igniting our primal fear of being devoured, annihilated, and absorbed into the void. Our unconscious mind screams out in protest. After all, religions, corporations, governments, social networks, even marketing experts promote the idea of the individual, a single unit with defined personal boundaries, likes and dislikes, to be quantified, verified, and identified. Besides, how else would they sell you pizza, materialistic placebos, and paranoia? How would they collect their tax and create high-rises and exclusive country clubs? The ego needs to feed, so we are told. If being an individual is so wonderful, then why are so many people plagued by endless and unrelenting loneliness? Technology is about to change the myth of the individual self, But the real question remains, are we ready? Using brain-computer interface, electroencephalogram, researchers are now able to send words from brain to brain and control the bodies of test subjects. 
Scientists at the Institute for Learning and Brain Sciences at the University of Washington have successfully used non-invasive systems to allow one human to control the body of another. This is just one example of current discoveries being made that will eventually lead us into a brave new world, a world of the hive mind. Wearable tech, digital contact lenses, exoskeletal suits, 3D printed organs, and deep brain implants are just a few of the current and future technologies that will usher in the new age of the biodigital. However, the hive mind is the one technology that will change everything. Mind to mind communication, digital telepathy, and biolocation are all just around the corner. Can we live in a world? where everyone is treated with the same amount of empathy, even if we know we are not created equally? Can we live with knowing what is in the mind of our neighbors, our families, and our political leaders? Can we survive as a species if we continue to view ourselves as individuals, or must we dissolve into the collective hive mind? So to dive further down into this philosophical idea of the hive mind, I uh, invited my friend Camillo uh, to talk about what the implications are of the hive mind. What does it mean for our species? What does it mean for our technologies? And are we, in fact, an original hive mind consciousness that manifests into physical individual forms? Are the technologies creating individualism or are they sh shedding individualism and bringing us back to our original code or source that's the question right i think um they are doing uh both at the same time and one side is actually just removing the facade like we all think we're one of a kind special subject you know subjects that are uh, non replicable and that is actually true for a very small percentage of ourselves mm -hmm. <laughs> so a lot of ourselves we are human carbon based homo sapiens we have a lot of structures that we share just the sheer fact that we are able to breathe the same air have the same language. There's a lot of commonalities between all humans. Uh, the psychic structures too. So we have to like, so I would say, let's say we are 99% the same thing, but there is some more transcendental part of us, the mind, the, the spirit, that there might be some uh, uniqueness to it. Mm -hmm. But we, we, we in, in um, rescuing that difference, we should not deny our commonalities, which is what binds us together. And I think technology does both. It just exposes the, 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 the stuff that we think is just us. Well, going back to the original first episode, we are nature and nature is technological. Um, that's where I'm working from when I'm talking about the future of hive mind. What I'm saying is that um, the technological uh, collective that is us, you know, the star stuff that Sagan talked about, yes. that as that emerges into higher order consciousness, which is what we talked about in episode two um, with James Hughes, that is leading us toward an amalgamation of consciousness again, but not necessarily from the point of evolution, natural evolution or evolution, biological evolution. It's moving us there in a technologically advanced evolution um, using these external components that, that are sort of recycling from the base code, if that makes sense. So what I'm saying is right. it, it is the, it is the turning inward that you and I talked about a long time ago. I think it was you and I that talked about how life begins with an inversion. 
when cells yes. <laughs> and you actually didn't believe me at the time. Yeah, we actually had and to I, Google and that, I had and to, it was exactly that. <laughs> it is. It life begins uh, with an inversion because the cells. I, I, I'm trying to remember the exact scientific name of this, but the the cells, the embryo, actually inverts in on itself, and that is what becomes the human form. So we actually start externally. And we, we invert biologically. So this is what I'm saying about, you know, us being nature and nature being technological. Those, those seem like two separate ideas, but, but they're in fact one continuum that is in some ways just constantly inverting and uh, almost like a Taurus, you know, sort of moving inward and yeah. then flipping out again. So the hive yeah. mind to me is the next logical step towards moving back. Um, if, if things do operate in a wave pattern, um, it, it comes in and comes out as a fluctuation. So we come out of the ether from the collective oneness i hate to say it that way but that's the only way to say it <laughs> the collective oneness you know the star stuff the biological soup uh the conscious the collective uh unconscious the primordial consciousness of whatever it means to be conscious we come out of that um into this individual state which is the sort of individual human body and individual human brain and then possibly, because we don't know what happens after death, um, there's speculation, but there is a possibility that we move back out of the individual self into the uh, collective again, uh, back into a oneness. <clears throat> now, what's happening, and this is interesting, um, I just watched a Netflix documentary a couple of days ago called surviving death and each episode was about you know one episode was after death uh, or or um near death survival one was about ghosts one was about mediums one was about reincarnation so each episode has its own theme and the common theme in the show and what people reported that have died and been and i'm saying dead for 30 minutes kind of death so right. this is not this is not something where people are not sure whether they died this woman one, one of the women in the show was underwater for 30 minutes she was dead wow um and she like so many other people that have near death experiences or true death experiences it's not near it, you actually die right she reports this feeling of wholeness and oneness and coming back to a source and sort of feeling like um, she was everywhere at all times and, and could know everything. So there was this expansion of consciousness that was not individual and not contained the way we, we are in this life. Right. And so that's when I, when I say that in the beginning of the show that we are moving towards a technological, a biotechnological space where we may, we may be able to puncture this individual, this individual consciousness and see into that, that space where we can bilocate, where we can be uh, almost in a quantum state, where we can be in the minds of many people. Well, isn't that what we're experiencing now? I mean, when when you post a picture of your vacation or when you uh, take a video of a protest from your perspective, from your phone, and I see that, am I not suddenly within your perspective? So is technology... And the line that separates the um, spiritual world, because the spiritual world and the scientific world don't often agree, and they definitely don't intermingle, but on this podcast, obviously, we do. But right. 
that is well, very that's a very interesting space to be in. Well, yeah, but this so you mentioning this, uh, it reminds me of this TED talk by a, a neuroscientist, and uh, she talks how she had a a, a brain um, she had some sort of heart attack, some sort of her brain pretty much some sort of stroke of sorts and half of her brain mm -hmm. pretty much just went down and that half of her brain that went down what is the one in charge of creating limits the one the, the one in charge of creating the ego the, the sense of self so she is narrating how when that part just shut off the rest of her brain took over and then she was floating and connected and she felt peaceful uh, even though there was something in the back of her mind just telling her you have to call someone you're having a stroke this is going to be serious <laughs> but at the same time she was having this oh my god i'm connected to everything this is beautiful you know like this is what we forget this is the connection to everything else the the illusion our brain is a is another machine it's it's a simulating it, it's our interfacing with reality Mm -hmm. Like that's what we forget. Like what what is consciousness? Are we creating it or are we interfacing with it? Are we receiving it from somewhere else, from the the oneness? Like like, like we said, mm -hmm. um, what I, what I think would happen or uh, end up happening with the hive mind is we would just start being able to use that hardware, our brain or wetware, mm -hmm. with some easier to configure hardware, be it Neuralink or any other you know, um, uh, brain uh, machine interface of sorts, whatever we, we design, mm -hmm. and start using that to be able to control our brains better, which is, you know, you can also look into more spiritual things and like uh, meditations where you can actually have outer body experiences or at least, you know, transcendental spiritual experiences. And this is, documented scientifically so it's it's it, 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 it there's a very obviously very hardcore uh, positivists will say nope there's nothing to prove there uh the spirituality is not our realm you have to you know keep both apart but every time we dig deeper they seem to be very connected and we seem to be even the hardcore physicists and engineers end up finding, you know, quantum theory, end up finding uh, gaps. Spooky, spookiness. Spookiness. Yeah. yeah. Spooky, spooky action at a distance that cannot be, that, that's <laughs> yeah. very, you know, that it ends up coming together whenever you see it from those perspectives. It's a yeah. matter of it is all connected. Literally, it is all connected too. Like the atoms are 99% space. Mm -hmm. like that's mm -hmm. a scientific hard fact yeah. that we just tend to forget well anytime you start talking about piercing the individual consciousness um you know when you you know when you get into the realm of um telepathy which i've experienced myself and if you had told me before I went to Peru and worked with ayahuasca, if you had asked me whether telepathy was real, I would say, well, you know, I, I don't know because I've never experienced it. But to have it happen to me, all I can tell you is that my experience of it was so true and real and provable that um, – there's no, there's no doubt in my mind that it's that it is possible to have this sort of t um, telepathic uh, connection with other people because I experienced it two or three times, and one of the times that was most remarkable was when we went into the ceremony to uh, take ayahuasca. I think it was the first night. Um, mm -hmm. It was like 20, 27 people were there, twenty six right. people. And there was a woman that came in. She was from Lima. I think she had driven in from Lima. We were in Cusco. And she came in really late. So she, she, she actually came in almost as the ceremony was just starting. And she sat across the, the room from me. It's in a, the room is in a big circle. The, the space is in a big circle. And um, we start taking ayahuasca and it was going to the left. So she was like the third or fourth, third or fourth person to take, um, 
you know, take the ayahuasca. And so I was, I was probably maybe 18, 19 in. So when they turned the lights out and when the ceremony started, I could hear people getting sick and it was just going around the room. And when it, after it came to me and after I started to get into that, whatever that space is that you go into with ayahuasca, I, she was making sort of grunting and it sounded like she was sick, but she was also sounded like she was in pain. And I had this image of her, her face turning into a, a, a monster where the, the nose and the, the, the lips was stretching out almost like um, a werewolf, like her okay. face was stretching and she was, turning into this beast and it was as clear as I could see anything in my waking life. It was very clear and it scared me. It frightened me. And and I made note of it just because it was so odd. It wasn't until the next morning. Uh, I, and we'd never talked um, because she came in late and then I didn't see her until the next morning when we had breakfast. Yeah. And I, she sat down beside me and we started talking and, um, I wanted to tell her about that vision of her turning into this monster. Although I, I thought it might be offensive, but before I could even tell her, it was maybe two or three minutes into our conversation. She said to me, the weirdest thing happened to me when, when I first started going into this ayahuasca journey, she said, I started to feel my face stretching and I was turning into I don't know if she used the word werewolf, but she said she started turning into a monster where the face was stretching out. Mm, right. So I, and I said to her, that's an amazing experience because I actually saw that. And did, you know, were we seeing that at the same time? And anybody who's experienced the ayahuasca um, journey, especially with multiple people, there is a frequency that you get to that is a hive mind frequency where all of you are on the same plane. Yeah. Synchronicity is a thing. I mean, no matter how much (laughs) I, I, I have, I fought it for the longest time. I try to be the most skeptical person ever, but once you go into ayahuasca and psychedelics, you it's, it's, it's inevitable. It's there. It's a thing. It's been oh, it's totally, too. It's totally real. It's absolutely, it's, it's just absolutely so real. It's and so hard to grasp for a lot of us, though. And here's what's so strange is that scientists will say, well, it has to be, you know, you have to be able to replicate it. Well, every single time people take this, they replicate the same experience. Exactly. I mean, yeah, that, that, that's a Terrence McKenna quote. It's like, listen, you have any doubts, take a, you know, a Take your five of, grams. Yeah. yeah, five grams, silent darkness, and you will experience it. And he actually mentions this with DMT. is like, just smoke three toes and you will transcend dimensions. Yeah. If you're a skeptic, it's there. You don't. I don't have to tell you. You don't have to read. You have to take the experience and then let me know what you find because it's yeah. there. Yeah. I think there's a lot of charlatans out there. I think there are a lot of liars out there. I think there are people who have some need um, – to be recognized for things. And I think sometimes they can fool themselves into believing things that aren't necessarily true. So you have to be, you have to be a skeptic to a certain degree, but you also have to be open for your, for your own experience. So when I sort of feel like when I experience something firsthand and when I keep my logical mind to the forefront, then I trust that experience. Mm -hmm. So during the uh, sessions, I had three ayahuasca sessions um, in Peru. And every moment of those sessions, I tried to keep myself, I I wouldn't let myself go all the way down into the experience. Um, That only happened a couple of times because I was afraid um, to lose the logical part of my experience in my brain. Um, but the most profound things happened, obviously, when I let go of that. But I can tell you that when I, some of, some of the experiences that I did have that I am absolutely sure of 
were the experiences where I was still semi-conscious and aware of what I was experiencing. So I was questioning, am I having this vision for real? Am I really hearing this? Am I really communicating? Because there was another time, and this is another part of the hive mind idea, there was another time where I was testing it, where I would, I would, someone was, um, there was a, another woman there that was having um, a really bad experience. And I, she was being very loud and it was affecting the whole group and it was affecting me. And I, I, I was, I started talking to her in my mind because mm -hmm. I wanted to test whether right. there was some sort of, you know, connection yeah. there, some sort of uh, telepathy. And the minute that I made peace with what she was doing and the minute that I sort of said to myself, I can tolerate this, I have enough love to tolerate her pain, mm -hmm. she stopped. It was instantaneous. Mm -hmm. And I, there, there was just this sense on multiple levels and multiple times through that uh, experience that, that a hive mind was present, that... Um, telepathy was there that i was seeing visions of what other people were seeing i was feeling what other people were feeling and that was also shared among other people towards me and and other people in the in the group so just first hand experience i do know that that is real and yeah. uh, how do we explain that how do you how do you so as a scientist or how do you as a logical thinking technologist how do you explain that i mean so this is the whole thing we are this is a side of technology that we have very little experience with yeah. uh the shamans are the technicians for that kind of stuff they they're the, they're the original they, technologists they, yes exactly it's it's the molecules it's it's all technology you know like there's a reason why our brain once again it's it, it's the wetware right it's the connection of our brain is the one that l links us to the rest of stuff at least yeah think of i would think of the brain as our operation system like that's the thing we connect to at least materialistically because it's the one that's connected to the higher levels to the mm -hmm. higher realms um and we what i think will happen is on the one side we will start studying it more because there's a psychedelic renaissance and it's like okay this there's something there that we have to study and then the other side we're coming in from the hardware part which is the you know uh brain and uh brain mind interfaces and whenever we start decoding how the brain works and how we can make our more uh, silicon based hardware work hmm. it, it, you know how, how how the codes once again how they start talking to each other that's when we're going to realize oh okay this is it's a not once again it's a not, it's an artificial consciousness but you know what makes our consciousness the only way of consciousness that there is or the only valid one it's just the only one we happen to know so whenever it starts merging, whenever it starts, you know, whenever we start experimenting with these things in our brains is when we start realizing, okay, there is more there and we might be able to, uh, you know, configure or our brains to uh, receive and interact with more of the spectrum of reality mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that scientifically we know it's there. Like just once again, stating to scientific proven facts. 99% of the atom is space. The 1% that it's not is what we call matter. Out of that matter, the electromagnetic spectrum we perceive is, what, a 2%? It's, it's absurdly reduced. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and then on top of that, that percentage that we can perceive with our you know, eyes, uh, ears, and all our senses it's also processed through our brain that has a lot of biases, and it, it's, it's just... You a lot know, of filters, yeah. Uh, filters too, yeah, because it's like, okay, there's noise, 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 and we're just trying to make a simulation with like 0.1% of the actual information that is out there. So we're just well, upgrading are... ourselves to receive more and process more of that reality that is out there. The other part of this is that you sort of touched on it. The, the other part of this is that the indigenous and original technology 
that emerged to create the human mind is still very similar to what we carry right now. So yeah. you're talking millions of years of uh, neurological structure that hasn't changed, right? So human brain cells, for example, that is an ancient, ancient technology that, that mm -hmm. has been passed from generation to generation biologically. But the way we process the world and the way we, we view the world and interpret the world and then output that information, that is what I think covers that layer of hidden consciousness that is collective. Um, you know, Terrence McKenna said this, and this was precisely uh, what people needed to understand, but I don't think it really came through, is that culture is not your friend. Culture, as I said in the opening uh, reading, the culture distracts, culture fractures, right. culture individualizes, and it gives us a veil that keeps us from seeing that indigenous structure that was originally passed down to us, which is the 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 probably the base of our understanding of who and what we are, which is this original technology, which is the brain itself. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> you know, if you look at an, um, indigenous tribes and you look at how they live closer to nature, they commune with the animals, they understand the weather, they understand migratory patterns, they can predict in ways that humans, modern humans really can't because we are so separated from the original source code, which I keep saying is, tech, yeah. is, is nature, which is also technological. Yes. So if we, and I know the listeners, they're going to be scientific listeners that are going to be put off by ayahuasca. They're going to be put off by the idea of telepathy. I'm just telling you what I've experienced. I can't say that it's true for everyone. I can't say that it is true for the world. All I can say is I, I can report my experience. And that is what um, part I, of being a, a futurist, part of being uh -huh. a futurist and part of being um, a philosopher is also yeah. testing my experience. So I, what I like about talking this topic with you is that we both, a lot of people that, that like this topic, they just, they want to believe. Yeah. Usually I, at the beginning, I wanted to believe too, just because it's like mind blowing. But then, like you said, you start testing it. Like I, we, I think we both try to approach it from an, a skeptical point, even though we've had some life experiences that has showed us, okay, there is definitely something that has to be deeply uh, evaluated and analyzed, analyzed there mm -hmm. from a rational per perspective. You don't have to go, once again, uh, making the distinction. So I, earlier I said the brain is the operation system. I would actually change that to the brain is the device and culture is the operating system. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we don't have full access to the device because it blocks and limits it. Yeah. So once again, culture is not your friend in that sense. You can rewire your brain through words, through programming, through codes, magic. Once again, you know, spells, you cast a spell, but it's really just rewiring your brain to learn new things, new way of approaching reality. Mm -hmm. um, well, once again, I know the scientific uh, people will hate this, but holy, I mean, it's there. It's like... This is how we have developed. This is how science has developed. Science is also just another language. Like you're actually, it, it is really a way of approaching it. Mm -hmm. That it's, it's the a, method. It's the it's the, uh, it's the user interface. Science is yeah. That's what's interesting. So science and spiritualism are two different user interfaces. If that yes. makes sense. So one user interface looks <laughs> very specific and um, logical 
and another mm-hmm. user interface is a painting program. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so there, it doesn't mean that that the information behind that system, the code that's running behind that system, doesn't mean that that is not the same code. It just means that the user interface, which I think is what um, our belief systems are, they're just user interfaces. Because I can, I throughout my life, I have watched people. You know, part of part of who I've always been is as an observer. I mean, that is what a futurist is. I always say to people, futurists gaze where other people just glance you know i my part of my job is to observe deeply what is happening and find those patterns but and also too with with being a philosopher that's the same thing i'm i'm looking to see what other people are not willing to look at and so throughout my life i have watched people have miraculous experiences and then if you will bring that up to them even a couple of weeks later they will either say that it didn't happen or they will forget most of the details and only be able to give you a vague uh, recollection recollection of of that experience. And I'm talking really miraculous, strange, high, strange phenomena. Well, Um, integration is the hardest part of the psychonaut journey (laughs) because it's just like we are not, once again, we are not, uh, coded that way. We like just it's like no, it just it doesn't add up. So why deal with the cognitive dissonance? Just you know, skip it, remove it. Uh, yeah, yeah which it. is it's it. It, it, it's yeah, it's a disservice, honestly, because mm. it, it's well, sometimes well, it might be too much, but it's just like that's what we're here to do, upgrade. Well, and we also don't like things that we can't categorize and explain easily. So um, I've experienced weird strangeness that I keep questioning how is that possible or why did that happen or and here's the old question that you and I have talked about many times too is the brain and is the mind I guess we should say mind because mind is a a slightly different thing um Mm -hmm. is the mind creating the world or just observing the world now this it, you can easily slip into the simulation theory talking about this but that's not yeah. this episode we'll we'll have a simulation theory yeah. episode but well but this is the same thing we were talking about the metaphor for the hive mind being the internet your computer is mm-hmm. logging into something but you're also writing in it you're also creating in it mm-hmm you know, it's both. It's both things. Like one, the um, the whole the trying to reduce things is it, it's just mental economics because once again, our brain has a certain limit of capacity of processing things. Even more so with our limited uh, culture, with a limited uh, user interface, we mm-hmm. we don't we don't we. <laughs> For most people in our culture, we have the free trial with ads version of the whole thing. (laughs) And it's not like 5% of what the actual software is capable of. Um, You know, meditation, studying, it might change that. But for the most part, we just like, you know, we just operate on the most basic levels. Um, Well, let me let me talk specifically about technology for a second because we've been talking about the sort of metaphysical part of this in the opening um part of the thing that i wanted to discuss is the i the idea of using eeg um to read brain waves and to actually control behavior uh type uh remotely control other individuals and their thoughts and their bodies and so forth. So um mm-hmm. we're there now. That's already been proven in laboratories around the world. And it's it's gotten to a place now where it's so um obvious that a technological hive mind, I'm not even talking about some sort of spiritual thing. I'm I'm saying just the neurological hive mind. Right. is already here. I know a lot of people don't know that that is true, but it is. 
that we already have proven in the laboratories around the world and around and universities around the world, we have proven that we can cause people, uh, other test subjects that are also hooked up to these EEG systems to hear words or to, I can cause you to move your hand or I can lift a crane or I can. So there's, there's all of this rich, uh, provable scientific data that's, that is, that is saying to people just over the horizon where we're, where we're headed towards that we are going to be able to, um, hone in on that ability to, and maybe it's a primal ability to, that has always been there, and we needed the the exoskeletal technological um, scaffolding to to make it work again. Um, maybe in the pre individual biological state, we had you know the ability to know everything that's ever going to happen and ever has happened. But maybe we lose that. This is, I, I keep going back to this is, um, this is an Alan Watts theory. Um, he, he used to talk about the on off, um, like switching of consciousness being on and off and that, that there is no permanence in either state. In other words, there is an on state, which is what our listeners are listening to, they are conscious, they are aware, they're alive. And there's an off state, whatever that is when we pass away. But neither is, is infinite. So there, and, and he, he says this because, and I agree, he says this because there has to be a relationship between those two to have knowledge of either one. So without the off state, we would not know what it means to be conscious. You have to have the the understanding and the experience of being unconscious to be conscious. And so um, in that state of being unconscious, quote unquote, without body, are we in the source state where we're back to the energy, the quantum, the whatever it is that, that mm -hmm. is there waiting for us. Are we in that state? And in that state, do we lose our individuality and become this sort of hive mind again? Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is because if that is true, if, if at some point when we leave the body, if consciousness does move back into a wholeness. <laughs> These are such crude words, but if if it does move back into a wholeness um, or a quantum state or an electric state or whatever, where everything that has happened to the other minds that have also crossed into that space can be known, that's a powerful, powerful technological idea even though it sounds spiritual, it is like Would seeing that... the entire matrix when you've only known the, the small fragment of the matrix. But that's literally the singularity, the yeah. single point where everything True. is connected. True. Not the technological singularity, because this is, this is the, the, so the people that have mentioned the singularity is, you know, most knowledge, most people know is a Ray Kurzweil talking mm -hmm. about how, you know, technology will take over. Everything will be processed in the same machine. Therefore, everything will be connected, you know, hardwired, all connected into one thing. Um, what we forget is like another person that has talked about the same thing. The Opega point was uh, Gerard de Pardin. Um, uh, uh, it was a monk. I forget. Pardin. It's French. I forget the name. But he talks about the Omega point. And it's mm -hmm. the same thing. We are all just going. We are all crunching into come, going back to the singularity. The Big Bang was the initial state. You know, mm -hmm. what we were talking earlier, the on-off thing from Alan Watts is the same thing with the, the Big Bang. You have to create a difference in order to create. Otherwise, it's just, if it's all the same, 
there is no learning there is no confront there is no uh yeah there is no way of there's no experience yeah there's no experiencing the other exactly there's no experience here here's the key uh, just to wrap up this is the key idea for this episode i think um my intuition my gut feeling on this um because obviously one of the questions that i have been plagued by besides the idea of future and time itself is consciousness uh, every philosopher this is their this is their life mission is to try to figure out what consciousness is um my i suspect let's put it this way i suspect that what is really at the core of experience for us is that there may be one thing, one consciousness, one entity, whether that is universal or whatever, that without individual, um, without individual, without individualization cannot experience anything. So there has to be, um, an, an on switch of, of being an individual so that it can take that back to the whole and so that the whole can become individual again and can take that back to the whole, if that makes sense. It's, it's the same thing that happens in nature. A seed becomes a tree, which becomes a seed, which becomes a tree, which becomes a seed, which becomes a tree. Mm-hmm. So that in itself is what I'm, is, is what I suspect is really happening here. And one of the things that I keep saying about technology is that technology is, is piercing the spiritual realm. Mm. You know, think about the reason I brought up this uh, Netflix show, um, Surviving Death, is that um, technology has enabled more people to die and come back than ever before in our human history. There are more people on this planet right now that are walking around that have died than ever before. And we can only do that through technology that we've created. And so there is this, now we're, we're getting into, you know, the biblical realm here, but <laughs> there, there is, there is a part or of me. hypothesis, you know? Yes. Well, that's exactly where I was headed, but, but there is a part of this that does feel that, that does feel um, almost biblical and religious because it, it yeah. feels like the, the membrane that separates the biological world from the, the spiritual or the ether or whatever it is that is also there is being pierced by technology. And that is what interests me. That I am f- profoundly interested in why technology specifically, which comes from us, is suddenly piercing that world and bringing people back from the dead and enabling us to hear the voices of other people and move other people's bodies and see what they're seeing and record dreams. And <laughs> you know what I mean? Like we are. Yeah. Technology is literally a, is a scalpel just cutting through our reality. And what's peering back at us is that, that really strange, bizarre world that has always been sort of dancing right under the surface. And that hive mind idea is just one more layer towards breaking the boundary between the conscious and unconscious. Um, so that's, for me, that's, that's a profound um, question. You know, what is that world? Well, yeah, I mean, that that's, once again, going back to uh, nature is technological and technology is natural. It's the same thing. We are, we we're going into those realms through science and technology because they're there because they're mm-hmm. real because that's the next frontier <laughs> because that's that's where you know we've already figured some of the other superficial stuff so we got to deeper 
Mm-hmm. It, it just keeps going down. Literally, it, I mean, God knows where. Simulations all the way down. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> As above, so below, and you can go or fractal uh, mathematics. Uh, you can call mm-hmm. it whatever you want. Because and that's the thing. From both sides of the aisle, let's say, you know, the scientific, rigid, mathematical, uh, logical, yeah, yeah, well, Newtonian, but uh, and quantum physics, but like the 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 math, they have a lot of metaphors, a lot of you know formulas for a lot of metaphors in the spiritual part. They they are uh, there's a lot of parallels there. Um, and that is just mind blowing. Whenever you start seeing seeing that, it's like, yeah, no, we we have maybe we haven't dig deep, deep enough, but we it's not we it's not our first encounter with these realms. We're just getting better at it. True, and we're also building the technologies to enable us to see and understand the hive mind more clearly. Well, listen, Camillo, thanks so much for coming on the show and uh, talking with me about the hive mind. Be sure to check out all the other Futuristic Now episodes with Gray Scott on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, and all other podcast platforms. And please remember to leave a review and a rating for the show on any of the platforms that you listen to. And check out grayscott.com or follow me on Twitter at grayscott.